Hello, my name is Warren Hubler, and I am the Vice President for Health, Safety, Environment, and Training at Helmrick and Payne International Drilling Company. For purposes of this presentation, I am the co-chairman of the Oil and Gas Extraction Sector Council organized by NIOSH in 2008. The title of this presentation is The Business Impact of Injuries and Incidents. By way of background, NIOSH stands for National Institute for Occupational Safety and Health. NIOSH is the research arm of the federal government. Unlike OSHA, they have no enforcement authority over industry. NIOSH created the Oil and Gas Extraction Council in an effort to address the National Occupational Research Agenda focus on reducing workplace fatalities in specific industry sectors. One target industry identified in 2008 was the oil and gas extraction sector. This presentation is organized into six parts. The first is an introduction uh, from the NIOSH research in order to demonstrate the need for greater investment in time, effort, and money in promoting safety excellence throughout the oil and gas extraction industry. Parts two through six are taken from simple case studies and commentary provided by industry players and from some additional NIOSH analysis. The five case studies include looking at the loss runs of a very large drilling contractor with a very large deductible, a small drilling contractor with a small deductible looking at one specific loss time injury and the financial impact that incident had on that small drilling contractor. The third case study focuses on case mismanagement and this one was submitted by a third party safety resource that provides emergency medical services, EMTs and paramedics to remote drilling and work over type operations. The fourth case study was submitted by NIOSH staff and focuses on the indirect costs associated with lost family income from a typical oil and gas fatality. The fifth case study was submitted by the small drilling contractor with the small deductible and talks about the real costs of workplace injuries and fatalities. The NIOSH research reflects that the oil and gas extraction industry has one of the highest fatality rates in the United States. The fatality rate within our industry is at 27 deaths per 100,000 workers versus the general industry average of four deaths per 100,000 workers. The NIOSH data also reflects that those fatality rates are directly related to oil and gas extraction company size and company type, and this will be emphasized on a separate bar graph in just a moment. The oil and gas extraction workers employed by small drilling contractors are clearly identified as those at greatest risk of a fatal injury. More than 50% of the oil and gas extraction deaths are the result of either motor vehicle and highway crashes or oil and gas extraction workers being struck by objects or caught in or between machinery. We will see this in a bar graph form in just a moment. The NIOSH data breaks down here just company size regardless of company type. It shows the 27 at the bottom of the table 27 deaths per 100,000 workers in our industry. For a large oil and gas extraction company, the fatality rate is a 12, three times the national average of four. For a medium-sized oil and gas extraction company, the fatality rate is almost 22, or five times the national average. And for the small contractor, well service company, or independent operator, the fatality rate is over a 60, which would be 15 times the national average. This table clearly reflects that company size matters. This next bar graph breaks down the impact of company type and size. In this case, the benchmark is on the far right, and the benchmark employer is a super major oil and gas exploration production company known as the operator. In this case, 
medium size operators, large independent operators have a fatality rate two times the benchmark level. Small independent oil and gas operators have a fatality rate more than five times the benchmark figure. Shifting from right to left, the well servicing company. The very large well servicing company has a fatality rate three times the benchmark figure. The medium sized well servicing company has a fatality rate almost five times the benchmark figure. And the small well servicing company with less than 20 employees has a fatality rate nearly 14 times the benchmark companies. Still moving from right to left, the drilling contractors, very large drilling contractors, have a fatality rate that is four times the benchmark figure. Medium sized drilling contractors with about 100 employees, which would be about a four or five rig operation, have a fatality rate nine times the benchmark figure. And the small drilling contractor with 20 employees, which might be one or two rigs, has a fatality rate that is 40 times the benchmark data. This data reflects that company type and company size matter. The next bar graph breaks down the most common causes of oil and gas extraction fatalities for the period 2003 through 2009. The top two categories, as highlighted previously, include motor vehicle and highway crashes at 30% of all fatalities, and struck by, caught in, or caught between objects as 27% of the fatalities. Combine these two categories alone account for more than 50% of the oil and gas extraction fatalities in our industry. I'd like to take a moment to put special emphasis on the motor vehicle and highway crash fatalities. Since January 1st of 2001, my company, as a very large drilling contractor, has lost 57 employees, spouses, and children to off-the-job motor vehicle, motorcycle, and ATV accidents. Since January 1st of 2001, my company has lost six employees to work-related accidents. While working over 2,000 rig years, of activity. Only one of those six was a work-related driving fatality. For every one work-related driving fatality in my company, 56 other employees, spouses, and children from my workplace family have been killed in off-duty motor vehicle, motorcycle, and ATV accidents. Therefore, in my mind, off-the-job motor vehicle safety is the greatest threat to the safety of personnel in the oil and gas extraction industry. I would now like to transition to the case studies that are were the basis of a white paper on the topic of the business impact of injuries and incidents. The first case study was provided by a large drilling contractor with a very large insurance deductible. The source of this information was from that very large contractor's workers' compensation insurance loss run for a 10-year period from 2002 to 2011. Nearly 400 cases were studied from this loss run. In studying those cases, the average direct cost of an OSHA recordable medical treatment case Offshore operations was $8,500 each, and onshore operations, $6,500 each. Working our way up the safety pyramid, the average direct cost of an OSHA recordable restricted workday case offshore was $21,500 each, and onshore, $25,000 each. Next, the average direct cost of a lost time injury or lost workday case offshore one event was $198,000. Onshore was $200,000 each. According to the safety textbooks that address the costs of injuries, the indirect costs of injuries are estimated to be five to seven times greater 
than the direct costs. You don't need to be a Naval Academy graduate to know that the bottom part of the iceberg is a hazard to safe shipping. In this analogy, the bottom part of the iceberg representing the indirect costs of injuries is also a hazard to good business, regardless of which industry one might work in. Some of you may be wondering, well, what makes up the direct and indirect costs? Here is a short list for your consideration. Of direct costs first, the emergency medical services and transportation to provide an ambulance or a life flight, a medevac, in order to bring an injured employee in our industry to medical care. Then the medical treatment or dental treatment, for example, for a chipped tooth from a blow to the mouth, a struck by incident. The rehabilitation and or physical therapy follow on to the initial medical treatment provided to an oil and gas extraction worker. The insurance premiums and deductibles that are paid by the employer or its insurance provider. The fees for third party insurance administration to utilize that service to help manage our workers compensation insurance administration. The indemnity payments for lost wages for employees that are disabled and unable to return to work and are required to go out on indemnity benefits. And then the regulatory fines and penalties that may be associated with a fatal incident or an event involving three or more disabling injuries. The indirect costs of workplace injuries include the time spent finding replacement personnel, hiring and training permanent replacement personnel, the pre-hire physical exams and drug and alcohol screening before we provide that new employee an indoctrination prior to going to the field. There is loss of productivity while we're shorthanded maybe a day or two or maybe even a week. The time and travel to go investigate and correct the mishap to develop those corrective actions and then to execute those corrective actions across the entire fleet. And then the time and travel perhaps to Houston to explain to the operator why the event occurred, what were the contributing causes, and how are we going to prevent it from happening again as the oil and gas operator holds the contractor or well service company accountable for the mishap. The indirect costs also include the damage control efforts required to resume normal operations. The downtime uh, until we are able to resume normal operations and we are off day rate or whatever the typical pay scheme is from the paying operator. In big figures there's the cancellation of contract and lost revenue for unsatisfactory safety performance for that particular rig or that particular uh, well servicing operation. And then if there is damage to reputation, there is potential lost future revenue due to being unsafe which could add up to millions of dollars. I'd now like to give a few examples of what these might look like. Here's an example of a material handling activity while rigging up a choke hose to a choke manifold. If the choke hose slips, if the slings or rigging fails, if we are using the improper rigging for carrying out this activity and that choke hose shifts from right to left, that employee's hand or finger is going to get caught against that yellow handrail section that was not removed from the choke manifold platform. The end result will be a mashed finger like a grape that is split open and now requires medical treatment or may result in restricted duty. Per the loss run data presented earlier, the direct cost for an event of that type is $12,500 for this large drilling contractor. The indirect cost using the factor of five conservatively would be $62,500 per event. The total cost therefore for each OSHA recordable medical treatment or restricted workday case could be $75,000 per event. Now let's shift to a potential lost time, lost workday case. This picture reflects an oil and gas extraction worker that had fallen onto a piece of scaffolding that was pointed straight upwards. It has uh, projected through his buttocks. Uh, we would call this one a real pain in the ass. An incident of this type that's going to require extensive medical treatment, rehabilitation uh, going forward 
would have a price tag direct cost two hundred thousand dollars per event if we multiply that two hundred thousand by five the factor of five to get the indirect cost it's now one million dollars and the total cost for each lost time or lost workday case would be one point two million dollars in order to understand the business impact of these types of injuries and those costs we measure our positive cash flow and margins in terms of our day rate minus our operating costs to calculate our positive cash flow. If our day rate for a drilling rig for this large drilling contractor is $25,000 per day and if the operating costs in order to operate that rig to include the labor costs, the burden, the insurance benefits, the payroll taxes, the materials and supply, perhaps the fuel to operate the rig, if all in our operating costs are $15,000 per day, then the positive cash flow for that one rig is $10,000 per day in an up market. In a down market with pressure on day rates, the day rate earned may be $16,000 per day with the employer's objective to simply try to break even to keep those 25 or 30 men gainfully employed the operating costs do not change then the positive cash flow is one thousand dollars per day in a down market so the question is how many days must a rig work after sustaining an OSHA recordable injury to cover the total cost of that injury before that rig is making a contribution to the bottom line profits of that company well, here's the answer in terms of zero margin days with no contribution to the bottom line profits of the company. For the less severe medical treatment restricted workday case, the mashed finger that split open like a grape, in an up market for the next seven and a half days, that rig operation as a profit center is making no contribution to the bottom line profits of that large drilling contractor. In a down market with a $1,000 per day positive cash flow, that rig now has to work 75 days at zero contribution to the bottom line profits of the company to cover the cost of that mashed finger. In the case of the lost time disabling injury, it would take 120 days in an up market for that rig to earn enough to offset the total cost associated with that $1.2 million event. In a down market at $1,000 a day positive cash flow, that rig now has to work 1,200 days or nearly three and a half years simply to cover the cost of that one major mishap that occurred perhaps during rig up on a new location. One way that operations folks in a drilling contractor uh, measure their operational performance is looking at their downtime. A similar response to the same question in downtime days where the rig is off the payroll at zero day rate, the injury that cost $75,000 for the mashed finger, the medical treatment restricted duty case example, that rig is essentially operating at zero day rate for three days. In a down market, it would be operating at zero day rate for 4.6 days. The lost time injury in an up market that rig would be operating at zero day rate for 48 days in an up market and 75 days in a down market. I know that within my company, if I tell a drilling superintendent that he's going to be down for three hours, he is going to be taking swift action to bring corrective action to bear to get back on the payroll with our paying customer. To tell him he's going to be down for three days, he will be jumping through hoops to make corrective action. When we see an unsafe practice in the workplace and we choose to walk by it, to ignore it, to overlook it for fear of creating some disagreement or creating some adversarial relationship with the person who's demonstrating an unsafe practice, we are essentially saying we are willing to sacrifice anywhere from three days to 75 days of day rate because we're not willing to engage the other person in a sincere and heartfelt safety conversation.
I'd like to give one example from this case study number one of an incident without injury and without a fatality. A drilling contractor's worst nightmare might include a drop blocks incident as reflected by this photograph. The cost of that drop blocked event or a parted drill line event might look like this. A new service loop, $10,000 because one was parted, $15,000 for a new spool. New elevator links and elevators, $25,000 the rental equipment and trucking in order to recover from that downtime event fifty thousand dollars the crown and traveling equipment inspection and repair fifty thousand dollars the lost revenue because we were down for eight days at twenty five thousand dollars a day two hundred thousand dollars and the top drive system repair for parts and labor three hundred thousand dollars the total direct cost of a drop blocks event could be $650,000. Using the factor of five again, the indirect cost would be an additional $3.25 million. The total cost of that one event, $3.9 million. If the rig is making $10,000 a day positive cash flow in an up market for the next 390 days, that rig has to work at zero contribution to the bottom line profits of the company to recover from that one drop blocks event. So from a drilling contractor perspective, how many rigs can you operate at zero margin or zero day rate and still remain a profitable business? I'd like to offer up one famous quote for your consideration. The quote is very simple. No margin, no mission. Those words were spoken to me early in my career as a safety professional for Helmerick and Payne by our former Vice President of U.S. Land Operations, Pete Miller. Pete has long ago left h &P and is presently the CEO, President, and Chairman of the Board of National Oil Well Varco, a small business, sarcastically, in our industry. I consider Pete to be one of the wise men in our industry and he really nailed it with this very simple quote, no margin, no mission. If our companies do not produce a profit margin, the HSE staffs for our respective companies will have no mission because all of the rigs will be stacked and we will be unable to put food on the table or roof over the heads of our respective families within the oil and gas extraction industry. I would now like to transition to case study number two. This is for the small contractor with a small deductible. And it focuses on one event. The source of the information is from the workers comp loss run for that small contractor. The lost time injury involved a partial amputation of a thumb for a driller on one of their rigs. It resulted in the employee being off work for 14 days followed by 94 days of light duty. The direct cost for the medical treatment and lost wages associated with that event was $24,000. Again, using the factor of five, the indirect cost associated with that event was $120,000. The total cost for that one lost time injury to this small drilling contractor was $144,000. This particular contractor had a positive cash flow of $5,000 per day. If we divide 5,000 into the 144 for the next 28 plus days, that rig that the driller came off of was making no bottom line contribution to the profits of that company. It has a much more significant impact on the smaller contractor and their business models. Here's a photograph of what that injury may have looked like. I'd now like to transition to case study number three and this information was submitted by a medical care service provider that provides on-site emergency medical technicians and paramedics as safety resources to remote drilling operations. In this scenario, the rig worker sustained a wicker injury through his glove during his workday. The steel cable was contaminated with grease and mud, therefore causing some infection. The injured party ignored the injury and did not clean the wound. He delayed reporting the injury until three days into his days off when it started to swell and be very tender to the touch. 
Medical examination at a nearby medical facility revealed that a staph infection requiring IV antibiotics had set in. Several days into the IV antibiotics, the injury did not improve. Therefore, the injured party was admitted to the hospital for surgical treatment to open, drain, and cleanse the wound. Here is a photograph of what that opening may have looked like. All for a little wicker injury that was not properly cared for at the onset. Case study number three focuses on the skyrocketing costs when injuries go unreported and or mismanaged. In this case, the wound was left open for three days in order to irrigate and drain the wound. It resulted in 18 days of hospitalization followed by six weeks of restricted duty. The actual direct cost for this event for medical treatment was $80,000. The estimated indirect cost was $400,000. The total cost $480,000, almost a half a million dollars. But the real impact came from the potential indirect costs associated with the lost revenue upon loss of contract. In that case, the potential future revenue lost as a result of the oil and gas extraction operator canceling the contract because of unsatisfactory safety performance was $16 million to that oil and gas drilling contractor or oil and gas well servicing company. The conclusions from case study number three, effective case management is essential to control those medical costs. The utilization of safety medics in remote operations ensures timely medical treatment while the injury is small, it mitigates escalation of the injury severity, keeps it at the minor level, and helps contain the direct medical costs associated with that event. Another way to think about it, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. Another way, pay less now or pay a whole lot more later because of injury mismanagement. The fourth case study is taken from uh, a NIOSH analysis looking at the financial impact of lost future income from a fatality to an individual family. In this case, we have a 25-year-old oil and gas extraction worker that was killed as a result of being ejected from a company-provided pickup truck that drifted off the road and rolled multiple times. He was not wearing his seatbelt. He was ejected and killed. The direct cost for an event of that type to the employer taken from an actual 2011 loss run was $115,000 in direct cost to the employer. The biggest part of the indirect costs is paid by the family, in this case lost future income. Considering that this employee had 42 working years ahead of him going to age 67, at an average income of $87,000 per year that's been adjusted for inflation and salary increases using the consumer price index, that family lost almost $5 million in future income. The total cost of that event, $4.97 million, nearly $5 million with the brunt of it being paid by the surviving spouse and children. The fifth case study was submitted by the same small, privately owned, family-oriented drilling contractor with a small fleet. The points made here include somehow the employers find a way to absorb those direct and indirect financial costs associated with injuries and workplace deaths. However, the individual families do not. The ultimate price of workplace injury or fatality is paid by the employee and his or her immediate family. The bottom line of a workplace fatality, a mother and father have lost their son or daughter, a spouse has lost his or her soulmate, best friend, financial provider, emotional provider, and a child has lost his or her parent, coach, mentor, and hero. It is those families that pay the ultimate price. So while an employer will likely overcome the tragic loss of an employee from a workplace fatality, the effects on the immediate family both financially and emotionally lasts forever. The conclusions from this presentation, strong investment in time, 
effort, and money helps to prevent harm or death to oil and gas extraction workers. It helps protect families within our industry sector from devastation. It helps to improve individual companies' overall safety performance and financial performance. And it improves the image of the upstream oil and gas industry. In our opinion, from the NIOSH NORA Oil and Gas Extraction Council, safety is good business and a worthwhile investment. Here is just one snapshot of the proof. This curve represents the workers' compensation costs per man hour worked for that very large drilling contractor with a very large deductible. When that company began their journey in 1986, they paid about $1.80 for every man hour worked to cover the costs of their mistakes, to cover the costs of their injuries. Through 2010, that cost per man hour worked was down to 25 cents. And today, that drilling contractor is working 15 million man hours more than they did in 1986. If we multiply those two figures together, that is millions of dollars that is staying on the bottom line profits of that company because of strong investment in time, effort, and money to achieve safety excellence and to prevent harm to people in the oil and gas extraction industry. The yellow box is the experience modifier rate of that very large drilling contractor and it represents that they are consistently 60 to 70 percent below the industry average when it comes to buying workers compensation insurance. The average employer has an EMR of 1.0. Unsafe employers will have an EMR above 1.0 based on the number of claims over a three-year period and the average cost of those claims in terms of injury severity over that three-year period. As that three-year rolling average is looked at, that number is adjusted each year for the previous year's events, injuries, claims. For the employer with strong investment in time, effort, and money in pursuit of safety excellence, in this case the EMR is 60 to 70 percent below the industry average, and therefore that employer receives a 60 to 70 percent discount when it comes time to buying workers' compensation insurance, or they get a 60 to 70 percent refund upon having another good year. I hope that this presentation has helped you to better understand the business impact of injuries and incidents in your operations and I challenge you to consider how is it that you measure your profit centers. For the drilling contractor it's typically on a day rate basis perhaps on a footage basis. If you are a footage contractor how much footage do you have to drill to cover the costs associated with the OSHA recordable medical treatment, restricted duty, or lost time injury. For a well servicing company that measures your financial performance in different ways, I challenge you to consider how much in sales will you have to generate from those resources in order to cover the cost of one major mishap in your operation. And if you multiply those by the total number of mishaps that you have in your organization, I think you will better understand the business impact that injuries and incidents have on your financial success. Thank you.